Good evening. Welcome to Bible study here at Hebron Fellowship Baptist Church. I'm Daryl Binding, the senior pastor. We have been learning and discussing a series of lessons called Dream Work Makes the Teamwork. Tonight, we're going to look at Joshua, an amazing and interesting character in the Bible. And we're going to talk about this principle right here. Be the right kind of leader at the right time. Joshua went through many changes in his life. We first introduced to Joshua in Exodus, and he was a recruit of Moses. He helped Moses along as he got into ministry. And then as time went along, he became one of the spies, and so he was sent on reconnaissance missions to see what the promised land looked like. And he came back with a report, him and Caleb, that they could take the land. Then as he grew as a leader, he, he began to become a responsible disciple. He, he began getting responsibility. Moses had put his hand on him and said to the people that this will be the one who follows me. And then in the end of his life, he's known as a representative of the Lord, an obedient servant of God. Many of us try to figure out how can we be a good servant like that? How can I be a better servant of the Lord? But we got to go through our steps and changes of our personal leadership. We also when we're talking about our family, our organizations, uh, our, our churches, our ministries, our life, we have to go through developmental steps. And there are different times that you may have to use the principles of an old step in a new place because sometimes it's required. When I was in industry, we used to know that there were different types of managers that came into different kinds of situations. Some people were, were known as headhunters, head choppers. They, they came cutting heads because the, the company or the team was not performing like they should, so they would replace the leader. And when they replaced the leader, what would happen is the new leader would come in and would make examples and be a, a strict disciplinarian, rules, 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 regimentation, getting everybody back fit and, and in shape. Now, who in your life has had to come through and get you spiritually fit? to get you back in godly shape. Maybe it was a parent or a friend. Maybe it was your pastor or your Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was a hard lesson from life. But when it comes, you, you tend to straighten up and fly right. And then you have another kind of leader who would come in after everyone's doing right. And they would be more of a facilitator or, or a, 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 if you will, a, a player's coach where they got along well and, and people would perform at a higher level of productivity, but it was after they had made the corrections in what they were doing. And so what makes the difference? Having the right attitude. See, the leader's attitude and the team's attitude goes together. And you need to have a good attitude. The spies that Joshua sent into Jericho had to understand and know what Joshua knew when he was a spy sent in to spy out the promised land, that God was with them. So it's important to understand the value of a good attitude because a good attitude will make you give your best. A good attitude will make you support others. A good attitude will model excellence. You will do and show what needs to be done. A good attitude will then help you as a leader in your home, in your business, in your church. And you'll be able to help leaders develop and everybody will have better attitudes, better morale, and you'll get some momentum as a result of that. And so, as I was thinking about this and I was looking at through the book of Joshua and looking at the life of Joshua, there's some things that jump out. Again, his first introduction to us in Exodus and he's at a recruit and assistant to Moses. He was helping Moses along, but then I, I thought about his time as a spy when he was sent to the promised land. But then I thought about his time as a, as a warrior fighting in the battlefield that as he became more responsible for things. And then I thought about him after they crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land and they're, and they're approaching Jericho. And then at the conclusion of his life, recognizing and realizing all the amazing victories that God had given him and Moses throughout his life. But at different points and at different stages, he had to be a different type of leader. Sometimes it's kind of like a car. See, if you've got a car that's been stuck in the garage, then you have to be the kind of leader that can get things turned on. 
See, when the team needs a jump start, a lot of times you have to do all the work as the leader. You have to go in and unlock the door. You have to sweep the floor. You got to cut the lights on. You got to count the till. You got to make sure everything is done. And you have to be the first one there and the last one gone when the team needs to get turned on. And so how do you get the team turned on? Well, you got to find what the problem is. Because why isn't the team turned on? Before we began this recording, the light that we used to shine went out. And we started to panic. But then we calmed down and realized, first of all, check and see if there's power. And we discovered there was a short in a cord. And so we had to change a cord out as opposed to getting rid of an entire light. Sometimes we make that mistake in life, don't we? We think the problem is one thing and say, oh, the light's gone out. Let's get rid of the light. And the problem was never the light. That's how many of us treat God. Sometimes we think when God doesn't do things exactly the way we want them, oh, we're going to get rid of God. And it's not God because maybe we weren't obedient. Maybe Satan came in and tried to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Maybe it's the people that you've surrounded yourself with. You got to fix the problem. You got to find the problem. And, and then as you getting things turned on, you got to focus on your faith. Because when you focus on your faith, what happens is you begin to develop this energy. Dr. Martin Luther King said, if a man hasn't found anything he's willing to die for, he's really not fit to live. Do you have something that you are willing to exhaust all of your energy, intellect, and knowledge for? I found that in Christ Jesus. I found that that is the thing that gets me going every morning. That's the thing that makes me prepare and study and read. I'm thinking about Jesus while I'm watching movies. I'm thinking about Jesus when I'm driving down the street. I'm thinking about Jesus when I'm listening to music. And it doesn't matter what the type of music is. I always tend to turn my mind back around and give it back to the Lord. Because I've come from a mighty long way. What about you? And so, if you're going to get them turned on, if you're going to be that leader that gets the car from being stuck in the garage, out of the garage, then you might need to give the team a jump start. And then once you get them started, you're going to do it by finding what the problem is, fixing what the problem is, and focusing your faith so that then you can fan the fire so that the energy that is created, because there is something that is creating energy, now that energy can create movement and motion in your life, and your team can go forward. The second thing is, after you get them turned on, you got to get the team moving. So you go from a stuck in the garage situation, you may come to a team or a family or a situation or circumstance in your life where you're stuck in the mud. <laughs> Sometimes the team needs a jump if they need to get started. But when the team needs to get moving, sometimes the team needs a push. And, and there are so many people in life who need that exhortation, that little nudge to go a step further, to go a step faster. A little drill we used to do uh, in football is we would tie a, a bungee cord to one player and tie another one to another player and then we would play a game called pursuit and the key to it is that the faster player was in front and the guy that was running behind him had to run fast enough to keep up or catch up in order to improve that player's speed many times we we do things like that in life and if you want to give your team the needed push. If you want to give your family the needed push, if you, God needs to give you the push that you need, then you need to be what you want them to see. You got to model this thing for people. If I want you to run fast, then I better be working hard to run fast. If I want you to be on time and attentive, then I need to make sure that I'm paying attention when others are talking and I'm on time when I'm supposed to be there. It, it, it would be it would be wrong if you've got on your marquee that church starts at 11 o'clock and you consistently start at 1130 because it's not that you're saying, oh, you're working on your own time. You're telling those who are unbelievers that God's a liar. See, because you're God's representative. And if you've got it up there that it starts at 11 and you start at 1130, then you're saying God's a liar because the unbeliever only believes what you put up on the board. And when they show up and they see something else, you have destroyed their faith. 
And so you've got to encourage people on your team that you're going to model this behavior, not by showing up right at 11, but you're going to show up earlier than that. You've got to build relationships. You've got to build people. You've got to build productivity if you want to give the team a push. So it, the best way to build relationships is walk across the room and ask somebody something simple like, what's your name? How are you doing today? How can I be of help to you? What are you trying to accomplish? And how can I help you get something accomplished? Because, listen, don't, don't go across the room and you're not getting anything done. And you go over and it becomes one of those uh, water cooler moments where everybody's just sitting around talking about the latest uh, reality show. And no one's getting their work done. And then everybody's got the same level of productivity. They're not getting anything accomplished. They're not making anything happen. Happens in churches all the time. Happens in families. Happens in relationships. Sometimes you need a little nudge. Every now and then my wife has to remind me how much she loves flowers. I don't like buying flowers, but my wife loves flowers. And if I want my life to be healthy and happy, then I got to make sure that I meet the legitimate need that she has. So we got to build relationships. We got to build people up so that we can build productivity if we're going to get them moving. And, 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 and the process you have to do like Jesus did one time. He sent his disciples out two by two. He gave them some power and said, go out and, and exercise this. Try this. And then after you've done that, come back and tell me what you saw. And so he gave them enough power to succeed so that they would come back excited. you got to build in a win. you got to help them along the way to gain the confidence necessary. Because if you need to get the team moving, if you got to give somebody a push, you got to help them gain the confidence to keep moving. And the way you do that is not only do you build relationships and build people, you build win-wins, but then you build visions of success. It's kind of hard to tell somebody to get something done and you've never done anything. It's hard. We are creatures of habit. I'm not saying it's not possible. Because God has taken the least of these and done amazing things, and he's still doing amazing things with people with no pedigree, no, no history of. God is still doing amazing things. But when you're trying to move the team, you've got a mixture of people, some who've succeeded at things and some who have not. Joshua understood this. When he sent those spies in, he, 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 needed, he needed them to understand what he understood. God's with you. And they got to Jericho. And of all people to help them and save them, there was Rahab, the prostitute. And, and the amazing thing in a time like this is that in order for them to be saved, they had to go to someone who didn't necessarily look like who they were looking for. They didn't act like who they were supposed to act like. Because if you're supposed to be called to be an evangelist, and we all are, if you're called to go make disciples, and we all are, then we've got to be willing not just to talk to people that look like us, act like us, know what we know. We're supposed to help build them up. And that vision that God gave us to go into all the world and make disciples, hmm, to the places in Jerusalem that are like us, to the places in Judea that are near us, to the places in Samaria that are different than us, and even to the utmost parts of the world. That's what we should do. So we have to build visions of success if we want to get them moving because that vision is what's going to keep them going after you don't have to push them anymore. I can remember learning how to ride a bicycle. We started off with training wheels. And, and, and after a while, I got used to the training wheels and I would lean to one side on the bike, riding on that third wheel. But all I did was tear up that wheel. And I leaned to the other side and tear it up because training things are not meant for permanent conditions. And so after a while, we took the training wheels off and my older brother was holding the bike. He was holding the, the, the seat and I'm pedaling, I'm pedaling. He said, whatever you do, don't stop pedaling. And after I get going, he gave me a little extra push. And then I was pedaling, I was pedaling, and eventually I fell, and guess what? I had to get back up. I had to get started again. And after a while, I had to learn how to get started without somebody giving me a push. And that's what each one of us have to learn how to do. But we got to have a leader that helps us get moving 
Sometimes we got to get somebody to turn us on because we're stuck in the garage. Sometimes we need somebody to get us moving because we're stuck in the mud spiritually, emotionally, intellectually. Third thing is we need to get them moving in the right direction. Why? Because sometimes we get stuck in a rut. We get so used to going to the same place and doing things the exact same way that we start leaving out some of the important things that need to happen. See, sometimes a team needs a kick. Sometimes the team need, needs a jump. Sometimes the team needs a push. But when a team is stuck in a rut, sometimes they need to get jolted out of their, their seat of comfort, their place of comfort, because they're used to doing things the exact same way over and over and over again. And after a while, what happens is you forget that it was God that stimulated and moved you. You start thinking it was you. You start thinking you're the one who did it, that you made everything possible. And you forget it was God who set you on this course. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? You got to be willing to institute some things that will make people better. What I did to get through elementary school was not going to get me through middle school. And the way I studied in middle school was not going to get me through high school. And surely the way I studied in high school was not going to get me through college. What I did to interview to get a job, it's not what's going to allow me to keep a job. What I did to, to start working on the first day, it's not necessarily enough to get me promoted. We must continue to grow. And we got to make changes. It's amazing how the first person you meet on a job in school is always somebody who's telling you, now I know that's what they told you, but this is the other way that we're, supposed to, that we're going to do it around here. And they're loud, aren't they? They're loud. But God wants you to drown those voices out because you got to get moving in the right direction. Otherwise, you're going to still be on that worker floor that you started at 10, 20, 30 years from now. And if that's the place where God has you for ministry, you make the most of it. You help make sure you catapult people up because God still wants us to make disciples. But the question is, what kind of disciple are you making? We got to be able to, to communicate like we talked about last week. We got to be able to communicate effectively to change things. Because we want people ready and prepared not only to do what they're doing, but to do it successfully. God did not send us here to fail. He sent us here for victory. He's assured us that we have it because eschatologically, we know we have it because the Bible tells us we will see him as he is one day. We will. We know that he's coming back for his church. We know, we know that we've been set apart, made a royal priesthood. And, and, and if you don't know it, then the question is, do you know who Jesus is? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe God raised him from the dead? Because that's the issue. If you're listening to this lesson this long, that's, that's how you get out your rut. Get back to what Jesus said. Get back to what the Bible says. Then get back to what God teaches. Finally, Joshua shows us not only do you have to get people turned on by getting them from being stuck in the garage, not only do you get them moving by getting them out of being stuck in the mud, not, you, not only do you get them moving in the right direction by getting them out of a rut, but then every now and then, you have to change as a leader because sometimes your vehicle of life can get stuck in gear. And sometimes that means that you have to tune up. See, you start off as a leader who does everything because nobody's turned on. But then you become a leader who does fewer things because the people are moving. But then you become a leader that works critically to make sure people are moving in the right direction. But what happens when they're stuck in gear and they can't seem to go any faster and they can't seem to go any slower? Because some situations in life require us to slow down and shift down. And some situations in life require us to speed up and shift up. Well, how do you get them from being stuck in, the, in, uh, from being stuck in gear? Well, this is when you, you, the team may need a massage. Amen? 
That means now instead of you doing all the work, the team is doing the work, but you're going and spot checking the details to make sure that people are being effective and efficient. Amen? You, you keep the team on track and on course. You keep goals in front of them. Did not Nehemiah have to reset and recast the vision 26 days into his 52-day task of rebuilding the wall because the people had got discouraged because they had heard some negative things? And somewhere around the 26th day, he, he reminded them of what they were trying to accomplish. And then he gave them a new set of protocols because they heard that others were trying to do harm to them. And he told them, listen, in one hand, you got your spatula and you put up those bricks and that cement. In the other hand, you keep your sword for when someone comes to mess with you. In, in life, you have to be the same way. Sometimes you can't lose sight of your goal, but sometimes you do have to change how you're operating. The way I run up a hill is not the way I run down a hill. Because to run up a hill, I have to use more power and I have to run more forcefully. But when I run down a hill, I've got to turn my feet over faster. The way I drive up a hill is not the way I drive down a hill. I have to press and get more gas to get up the hill and maintain speed. But to come down the hill, i got to have sense enough to take my foot off the gas so that I go down at a speed that I control my descent. And in life, spiritually, that's the same thing we have to do. When we're trying to learn, let's focus in on learning. When it's time to apply what we've learned, let's focus in on the application. When it's time to teach what we've learned, let's make sure we're focused in on development. And so what happens then is you remove those things that bust your dreams. As a leader, you, you take out the obstacles that can cause some good folks in your group, in your team, in your family to stumble. Our children often don't understand when we say to them that you shouldn't hang around a certain person. It's not because you're better than anybody, but it's because that person is embodying characteristics that are unhealthy for your child. They're not, they're not following your child to a higher height. They're leading your child to a destructive place. And of course, the rebellious nature of all of us causes us to bristle up against that. But in the end, in the long run, we learn one way or the other that those who came before us were trying to teach us something because they were loving us. They'll turn around and ask, how could you see that? Well, in the same way, when Joshua sent spies into Jericho, it's because he had been a spy himself and he had to learn and know when he went amongst those giants and to get back safely, God was with him. And the spies he sent into Jericho, God showed himself to be with them through the home of a woman who was a prostitute, who kept them safe, who dropped them down from the window, whose life and family she saved, who is in the genealogy leading to Jesus. Because God can transform anybody and use anybody for his glory. So don't judge people by what's on the outside. Don't lead people by what you think they can do on the outside. But consider the heart just as God looks at our heart. And know that you have to be the right kind of leader who has to sometimes get the folks from being stuck in the garage, who has to sometimes get people from being stuck in the mud, who has to be the person who gets people from being stuck in a rut, who has to get people from being stuck in here. And you have to use the right type of leadership in the right moment so that they respond in the right way to accomplish their God-given assignment. I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for how we realize and recognize that you've placed us upon a team. And we're on a team to gain victory through you. So help us be the right kind of leader in the right time as parents, as peers, as participants in the kingdom building of God. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.